Um, is that better? I apologize, I have to sit down. Now, yeah, so we, we, we start our, our um, lecture series number five, which is the von Neumann architecture. If you're one of those who has access to last year's slides, you would have noticed that um, um, lecture five is tagged as mach machine structures, one and the same. I mean, we just thought we would explicitly state that what we are actually going to look at is the von Neumann architecture, right? And so before we start though, I thought, um, I thought it would be nice for us to just quickly, it's supposed to be beamed up, but there's no power. Uh, so I spoke about the, the makeup quiz for those of us, the seven that missed the quiz, right? You want to see, see me either during my, the office hours today, nine to 13, or you can send me mail and tell me to I missed the test and I, I would want to write. We know a way of, we, we have a way of checking if you indeed were not registered, by the way. You just log into SIS, right? Which is a computer software, right? Application software. Um, and then we had said that we're supposed to have practical sessions next week on Monday and Wednesday, but again, uh, the people haven't yet responded uh, on whether our booking request has been confirmed. Um, so look out for announcements on the mailing list and the Moodle. Uh, we'll send, send out an announcement once they, they confirm this, hopefully today. Uh, I sent out an email with regards to this survey that we're doing. You see, we realize that there are some of us that perhaps have not really interacted with computers as uh, as much as, uh, where is, what's her name? I don't know, the lady, she, she did uh, uh, the equivalent uh, diploma uh, course uh, that's offered at Wunza. So people like those we know, um, know most of what we're discussing, right? But if you're one of those who is new to this, you better fill in this thing, right? So that we know who you are, and then we can figure out how best we can help you. Right? It's a simple thing, just go there, we sent it via email, click there and fill in the details that we have there. Very important, right? Right, so the, the outline of the lecture series is as follows, right? So just do a brief introduction and then discuss this important concept, concept of the stored program concept, right? Uh, I'm going around in circles. Um, and then we'll go through the, the elements associated with the von Neumann architecture, right? Most emphasize on what would be tagging as the conventional von Neumann architecture, because the classic von Neumann architecture is only composed of four functional elements, and you'll see now, just now. Right, so as a reminder, right, um, so our discussion of uh, classification of computer systems and computer software uh, got us to a point where we now realize the full power of computers, right? Um, um, and we know that when we're talking about the general purpose nature of computer systems, it's, it's mostly aligned to the fact that uh, you can literally store tons of computer software on your machine, right? If I wanted, I could, I could just as easily turn this into um, a special purpose machine by just converting it into a server, right? I'll dedicate my four GB of RAM to just eat, maybe running a web server or something. <coughs> but um, even though we have all these different, all those different categories of computer systems, so embedded systems, uh, microcomputers, mini computers, mainframes, supercomputers, and all those fancy things, the point we're trying to emphasize in this lecture series is that they're all based on um, one unified model, right? So the basis for their design is, is the same. This is what we are calling the von Neumann architecture, right? Um, and you notice from our discussion of the von Neumann architecture that it actually aligns to those, those core elements of what we defined as being uh, the computer, you know, an electronic device that accepts input, processes the input, presents the changed input, um, as output, and there's an optional phase here, right, or process, um, which is associated with what? Storage of data that's been processed, right? Yeah? Pay particular attention to these things here. Um, so a visual representation here, uh, scenario, human being just typing on a computer, that's input, right? Um, th those signals are sent to the CPU where um, they're processed. If you're typing in Microsoft Word, obviously when you click the Save button, um, a document is saved to memory, right? Um, it goes here, right? Um, and then there's kind of like a cyclic process here where you get to see what you've saved somehow, what you're typing, right? So it's presented as output. Now, so, um, so this notion of the program concept, right, um, arose sometime in the 1940s, mid 1940s, I suppose, and this, this architecture, this model is actually named after a human being, right? Uh, I've forgotten the first name here. Huh. I can look him up, anyway. 
Um, but anyway, so prior to, to the proposal of this stored program concept, what, what used to happen is that, um, insofar as storage of data and instructions uh, is concerned, is that instructions and data were stored in two separate units, right? Um, but when the, pro uh, the stored program concept was, was introduced, uh, these people said um, it would be more efficient and effective if we actually stored data and instructions in the same location, right? So think of what happens uh, when we're saying, uh, oh, we fire up Microsoft Word and we know now that Microsoft Word is going to be loaded into RAM, right? And in fact, when you're typing those things in Microsoft Word, the text that you're typing is sitting in RAM up to the point when you save that Microsoft Word document, right? In which case, the saved content is gonna be moved to secondary storage, right? Um, so, we're saying that both instructions, the instructions in this case, are, uh, the, the instructions in this case are the, I'm going around in circles, are the instructions associated with the Microsoft Word application. Because Microsoft Word and these are, or Chrome itself, when the programmers are writing that code, we, we discuss that when they're designing such applications, essentially those applications are composed of what? Source code, right? Those single statements that we're talking about. Once you convert those to a uh, machine readable format into ones and zeros, they're, they're more or less like uh, individual instructions associated with that application, right? Those are the things that are loaded into memory as you are working uh, or as you're using the application. So we're saying those and the data that you use the instructions to process or to manipulate are both stored in the same location, right? But, but something else you want to highlight is the fact that there, there are other architectures that exist out there and the alternative architectures. And the one that will pop up the most is this thing called the Harvard architecture. It does the complete opposite of what the uh, von Neumann architecture does, right? So instead of um, storing both instructions and data in the same location, you have them stored in two separate locations, right? Um, you want to maybe just poke around the Harvard architecture and just read up a little bit more. Uh, we're not wasting time on it because our focus, now going forward, in fact, in all the courses that we're going to do be beyond uh, ICT 1110, uh, send that around the von Neumann architecture, right? Uh, pre uh, one of the reasons is that um, for the most part, most of these computer systems, be it embedded in server-based computer systems, actually based on the von Neumann architecture, uh, the computer systems that have been designed using the Harvard architecture are mostly experimental computers, and I guess those that are used for scientific computing, right? So they're not really in mainstream use. Yeah. Right, so in terms of the, the, the actual components that make up the Bonoma architecture, um, there's actually supposed to be four of them, four core uh, elements, the classic architecture, the model itself, that you find in literature. So there's an input-output unit, there's the arithmetic logic unit, the control unit, and the memory unit. Now, the reason we decided to, well, the reason we put the central processing unit here is just to highlight the fact that these two components, arithmetic logic unit and the control unit, essentially make up the central processing unit because they're solely or exclusively concerned with processing of the data, right? That is accepted by this computer system via the input-output module, right? So basic uh, scenario here is, uh, we've discussed this already, the input, uh, output unit is used for accepting input, right, from end users, right? We're not just talking about human beings here, it's end users, it could be a computer itself, another computer. Um, uh, I don't know, pe people have heard of, um, what do you call that, uh, camera traps? Anyone read, read up on, we have a lot of national parks here. Have you heard of camera traps? <coughs> You know how, uh, is it zoologists, whatever they call them these days, one of the uh, cheap tricks they use to try and identify, they'll spit out things like, oh, the, the population of hippopotamuses is going down, right? Or we have very few lions, right? How do you think they count those? Maybe in Zambia they fly around, they chop, no, they don't, right? Sometimes they'll just set around camera tra traps in strategic locations, and then they have motion sensors. So every time there's motion, so in national park, it's probably some animal, right? And it automatically gets, uh, it automatically gets like a, a snapshot, a picture of that animal, right? And then after some time, they'll collect those images and then analyze them, right? Cheap tricks that people use. So take our point here is that, uh, hey, there's no, the input, where's the input? There's no human being there. Surprise, surprise, right? Um, right, so take our point from the slide really is uh, the core um, components of the classic Von Neumann architecture, input, output, right? 
um, accepting input from end users and presenting output to the end users. Uh, the arithmetic logic unit, which we described just now, which is mostly concerned with performing uh, basic arithmetic operations, right? Uh, once we start, uh, once we discuss the, uh, the machine cycle, the fetch, decode, execute, and store, optional store um, cycle, you realize that uh, the things that are happening in this computer, even though it looks like it's doing complicated things, but fundamentally the things it's doing really, it's just basic mathematical operations, right? Adding and subtracting and multiplying and dividing, right? And in fact, we even get a, a more in-depth appreciation of this process once we start programming in, in assembly language and tracing those instructions, the path of the instructions, right? Remember I said it's a top-down approach, right? We're trying to understand what happens at a high level and then we're going down deep, right? So this instruction that we're saying, uh, a single instruction associated with Chrome, we will, at some stage we will trace exactly um, how it's decoded by the by the computer and how how that single instruction is converted into a form that the computer is going to understand the ones and zeros. At some stage, we even be converting these simple instructions into uh, corresponding ones and zeros. It should be a great, be really fun. I think the guys last year found it fun. And this decoding thing, by the way, the decoding of instructions is what the control unit does. Right? It's one of the uh, many tasks that it does. Right? And finally, we all know what the memory unit does. It essentially just stores uh, the data that's been processed and the instructions, right? Yeah? We, we know that, uh, uh, we discussed that uh, when we install this application, let's say Microsoft Word or Ocular or Acrobat Reader, when it's installed, it sits where? In secondary storage on hard disk, right? Which is memory, right? When you start it up, it's loaded into RAM, which is memory as well. Yes, there's a question there. Hi. No question, I thought there was a hand up. All right, so a, a few other points to note. Uh, we're discussing the classic von Neumann architecture, um, but the, 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 in actual fact, right, the, the von Neumann architecture is a lot more complex than, than we made it look here when we said it's made up of four main components, right? Um, from a very high level, you notice that because these components have to interact at some stage, right? Uh, input is accepted and then it's processed by the CPU. There's interaction be between the input output uh, component and the central processing unit or these subcomponents in there, right? So what we're saying is that um, there are things called uh, buses, for instance, that are required, right? To facilitate this interaction, for instance. These buses are nothing more than, we have a discussion, but they're nothing more than the wires that are on the motherboard if you open up the computer. Right? So those many wires that connect the different components in the motherboard are what we call buses, right? So do nothing more than facilitate the transmission of data and, and instructions, right? From one component to the other. Um, and then we will also now run and discuss these, uh, these units uh, or these hardware components called registers, right? Uh, very important uh, because fundamentally people obsess a lot about efficiency when we're dealing with computers, right? So you want to make sure that the computer is as fast as possible. And, and because the, the efficiency is somewhat compromised uh, when you're moving things in between components like the central processing unit and the memory unit, what people have done is they've figured out, they've come up with nifty ways of trying to make sure that, that the, the, the temporal storage of some of the information that is being processed before it's finally permanently stored into memory, um, it's stored somewhere on the CPU chip itself, right? You're, you're trying to avoid um, a much longer round trip going to the memory because the location in memory, for, so memory, main memory and CPU are located further apart. So putting these smaller temporal storage areas called registers on the CPU ch chip itself improves the efficiency of the processing, right? So you have registers that sit on the CPU chip, right? Very expensive components, which is why the, it's a bit of a shock really, which is why the size of these registers, and, and I don't know if I can show you the registers here, probably not, but the size of these registers is so small, right? Because they're expensive components. If you thought RAM was expensive, registers are even more expensive, right? At some stage when we discussed the memory hierarchy, you notice that as you move closer to the CPU, 
the memory units that you're dealing with become much smaller and more expensive, right? So CPU cache, registers, for instance, you know, RAM, ROM, and then storage, right? So your hard disk is cheaper than RAM, right? But RAM is cheaper than registers. Registers are potentially, I think, cheaper than CPU cache, right? Um, anyway, this, paper, this thing is not very clear, but I was trying to show us uh, the so-called buses and the location of this thing we are calling the CPU. Hey, I'm hoping the tutors are going to start soon. They were supposed to already, at some stage, they're supposed to rip apart some of these computers we have so that we start looking at these things. I mean, though that's not the focus of the course, it's supposed to be theory, right? <coughs> right, so on to a discussion of these we now zero down the discussion of these components of the conventional of normal architecture. We'll start with the buses. We already dis the, um, discussed or highlighted the fact that these components do nothing more than facilitate communication between the various components, right? By all sending data, right, in between the different components. And you notice that this data comes in so many various forms which we we'll discussed just now. Um, this is nothing more than just parallel connections. Uh, you find a lot of wires on the motherboard, right? A lot of them, a whole bunch of them. Now, someone would be wondering, but uh, if we can send signals wirelessly, like I'm doing now between this component and this, why, why is it that the signals on the computer are not sent um, wirelessly? Right? Why do you think that's the case? Any, any thoughts? Why is it that, um, um, why do we think that we remove the so-called buses from the motherboard? and just do what we do with some of these fancy devices, like we transmit the signals wirelessly. Yes? Can you shout? I don't know. Yeah, but so the, the question is why, why are those signals not sent wirelessly? Why, why do we have to have, because these buses are actual physical components, right? There are wires on the motherboard. So the question is, why, do we need, why, do we, why is it that we need to have those actual physical wires? Why can't we just transmit those signals wirelessly? Yes? Uh, if we have them wireless, I don't think uh, there is a way of communication. It says, it is no, said that uh, the bits, uh, it is the on and off. No, but it is being detected when the other wire, the other parts are in the other wire. <coughs> But how, how would we fail to detect them if we are detecting the signal just now? I mean, come on. Efficiency, key, is, key word here is efficiency, right? You see, they'll tell you that when you, just an example, bear with me. They'll tell you that when you, I don't know if you figured this out, connecting via Wi-Fi is much more, uh, slower than using a physical connection, right? Like an Ethernet cable or using fiber, right? That's a key word. It's efficiency. You want to transmit those signals as fast as you can. If it was wireless, it would be slow. All right. Um, so we, there, there are essentially just three, three main types of buses, the so-called buses. Now it's like a bus, right, to city market or something. There are three types, right, like the minibus and whatnot. I'm just joking here. <laughs> Trying to light, lighten up the mood. It's, people are so gloomy here. Um, <laughs> I've always, I've always, my philosophy when teaching is always uh, to have fun when, when learning. Yeah, that's what, uh, learning becomes exciting that way, right? Yeah, right. So there are three types of buses, right? The address buses, data buses, and control buses. And uh, we just walk through all the three here. Um, so the, the address bus, the name suggests, um, essentially just, um, indicates the address in main, mem main memory of the I.O. port uh, that needs to be accessed, right? So we, we discussed this whole notion of, let's say, transmission of um, instructions or manipulation of instructions, right? Uh, from RAM, I mean, the, the round trip from RAM to the CPU and all that. You see, the, the process is not as easy as just a signal being transmitted, right? There's a whole bunch of things happening behind the scenes. And so one of the things that happen is um, at some stage, the address of the instruction that you need to read from memory must be specified before it's read from memory. Right, so it's, it's not like you just magically say, send this instruction, or run this instruction, right? You go through a process, and you understand the process once you go through the fetch decode execute cycle. You go through the process where you specify 
the memory address that you want to fetch the instruction from, right? And so um, the transmission of where the, the address, where the date or the instruction is going to be read from is transmitted through the address bus, right? And then once, once, once the CPU figures out to say, and in fact it's a control unit, once it figures out to say, oh, this is the actual address that we need to read the instruction from, then goes into, uh, into main memory, in this case it's RAM, right? And it fetches the instruction, that actual instruction that it fetches using the address, right? It knows the address where the instruction is sitting, it fetches it, that instruction is transmitted through the, the data bus, right? And certain control signals obviously are um, transmitted through the, the control bus here, right? So read-write instructions, for instance. Uh, and hopefully once we, we have a discussion with fetch, execute decode cycle, people understand more about these things, remember these things. We are building up on everything, right? And the things that we are doing next term are gonna be centered around some of these things here. This is the easy part here, the input output module, we all know what this does, right? Um, it does nothing more than facilitate, you know, it accepts, it helps you um, uh, elicit input from this end user, so if it's a human being, right on as is traversing through the slides, right, that's input. So the input output component is the one that facilitates that, right? And then it presents the output using some interface, could be a graph, graph user interface, or it could be a command line interface, right? Um, and then it also enables communication between certain peripheral devices that might not necessarily be, uh, that might not necessarily be, uh, That might not necessarily involve interaction with an end user, right? Uh, so during our discussion of input output, uh, the input output subsystem and in fact peripheral devices, you notice that there are different types of um, input output devices. Some of them are called communications devices, right? Now, communications devices um, will not, so there's, there's no input that comes from an end user like myself, right? It's, it's all automated. These are things like routers, for instance, right? So you're sending, uh, I'm sending a WhatsApp, or I'm sending an email from this machine. Because um, on the UNSA network, I have to go set, through certain routers and whatnot. And so, you know, those are input output devices, uh, signals being transmitted, right? Which is why this thing is important. Right, um, and then just to highlight that uh, when we're talking about these input output devices associated with this input output mode, you are essentially referring to these things here, right? There's a whole range of things. And, um, we'll have a discussion on more examples that we have out there, like pause machines that we see in ShopRite, for instance, right? They do nothing more than um, um, facilitate like interaction between the input output sub, uh, between the input output component and the central processing unit. And we'll have a discussion of um, different techniques that are used to facilitate that interaction. But just to highlight that um, one of the most popular ways of doing that is using this memory mapped I.O. Uh, method, right? where your, your, your device actually appears uh, as a memory segment, right? So, it's, so this computer doesn't, the reason why I can use this thing here and this thing to do the same thing is because the, the computer doesn't really care whether, whether I'm using a mouse or a pointer, right? All it cares is that this, it, it has a specification on what needs to be done if I want to perform these operations, right? So I can use any device. In fact, I can even, people have implemented apps that you can use to navigate through the slides, right? You're just sending a signal, right? Uh, all that is made possible because of this thing that we're calling memory mapped I.O. technique, right? Uh, all right. I'll oh, still have time. <laughs> um, and then, uh, th so, the other important component, obviously, is the central processing unit, which we say is, we say it encompasses these other important subcomponents here, right? <coughs> Fundamentally, what it does is it facilitates the execution of these programs once they're loaded into memory, right? So you load a program into memory, and then it's going to be executed by the CPU. Right? After the execution, obviously, we had a discussion where we say that the optionally are processes associated with with that application, right? That's been loaded. That will be spawned, right? So you remember the example that I gave of Chrome? We looked at those. Uh, processes, I think there were five processes associated with Chrome at, the point, at that point in time. 
so it does all of this using, like I said, these three main components, right? But there's more inside here. We're just saying these are the main components that facilitate what the CPU does, right? So if, if you're interested in, well, we are interested in, if you look at your typical motherboard here, your CPU would typically sit, sit on this socket here, right? So it sits here, and it's, it's actually a very, and we know this, but it's a very small component, right? It's just a zoomed out. Um, <laughs> but what you notice is because there's a lot of processing that goes on on the CPU, there's usually what they call a fan, right? So if you sit quietly, you notice that sometimes my machine will make funny noises, right? Uh, that's a fan, right? Because of the processing, there's heat being produced, so you want to cool, right? The, the, um, the socket where the CPU is sitting. Right? Not only that, there's a, this thing is a heat, there's usually a heat sink that also helps absorb the heat as well. All right, so control unit, right? What exactly is this thing? Um, what it does is, like I said, it helps, so you have this instruction that, you have this program that's been loaded into memory, um, instructions associated with the, 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 that program that has been loaded into memory executed one at a time, right? It's, it's not like uh, when I'm running Chrome, it's not like all those instructions associated with uh, Chrome are going to be executed, no. The CPU actually is so dumb that it executes that it executes those instructions one at a time, right? So I don't know how many instructions like Chrome would be associated with, but probably thousands, of, yeah, thousands of them. Uh, so depending on what I'm doing on Chrome, the one one instruction that's quickly executed by by the CPU, right? And this is where those things like uh, 2.5 gigahertz, like my processor oscillates at a frequency of five, 2.5 gigahertz. What that is saying is that um, is it Two, two what? Two, is it billion, right? Yeah, it's two billion, right? Two billion instructions per second. That's how fast it is. So even though the CPU executes these instructions one at a time, but it does it at a very fast rate that you're able to do so much, right? So two billion instructions per second means that it's, it's uh, how many, let's do some, people are sleeping here, let's do some math here. If we are saying, if we are saying, let's say we have uh, 2.5, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3. What we are saying is if, if we have, uh, let's just say 2 gigahertz, right? If we are saying what, uh, it, it oscillates at 2, two gigahertz, we're saying two, 2 billion instructions in one second. So in one second, we have 2 billion instructions, right? Then how long does it take to execute one instruction, this thing we're describing as one instruction, that is being decoded by the CPU, right? Yeah, it's just the inverse of, uh, it's the inverse of two billion essentially, right? And I don't know if I, we can, but you notice that it's done in a, in a in, it's done at a rate that the human brain cannot even conceive, right? But it's one at a time. But of course it's not, human beings are never satisfied with those things, right? Uh, with with the one divided by two billion, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, right? It's a lot. But of course, human beings are not satisfied with this, which is why they've come up with other 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 uh, cheap tricks. Like you have like a quad core processor, right? So you have uh, a CPU that that is able to process information at four times the rate that something that does it at uh, two million instructions per second does. Right, which is even faster, right? Right, so something else that this uh, control unit does is it coordinates a, uh, the retrieval of operands, right? Uh, I mentioned that one of the things that happens is, especially when it comes to the ALU, is uh, this uh, uh, performing, it, it performing very basic arithmetic ta tasks. Let's say adding two numbers, right? One and two. So what? What happens when that one and two is being added is that um, the retrieval of the operand, which is the plus, the plus sign here, because we're adding, is done by the control unit, right? And then it also figures out the order in which the instructions are going to be executed, because we said that this program, once loaded into memory, obviously has thousands of uh, instructions associated with it, right? So it's up to the um, control unit to figure out exactly how these instructions are going to be executed, right? Uh, we'll continue our discussion on um, Maybe Wednesday, uh, if the Monday 
if the Monday uh, practical thing is, is uh, confirmed, then we'll not have a lecture, we'll go into the lab and just play around with the operating system and those other funny things we discussed. But if the lab, the, the booking request won't be processed, then we shall continue our discussion of uh, the von Neumann architecture, which is really interesting. Unless if there are any questions, no. Yeah. Yes? Is this making sense though? Right. <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> Sorry? <laughs> You're thinking of what? Oh, Matt. Like what oh, Matt. Yeah, but we, we learn like that. I mean, the, I, I guess the, the advantage is it's out of what? It's 1% of the exam, right? Ta da! Yeah? All right, thanks. And uh, see you when you see me, Monday, obviously. You, you, those of us having trouble with Moodle, you, you use your SIS credentials apparently. Have you tried that? Yeah, the problem is I, I, we have very little control over, over Moodle now because of what they've started doing. 